So journalists are not supposed to be fans of these CEOs, but I was a Brenda Barnes fan for about a decade. And some of you are too young to know this, but I'll fill you in very briefly. Uh, Brenda was the top woman in the consumer packaged goods industry when she was running PepsiCo North America in the 90s, Pepsi-Cola North America in the, in the 1990s. And she just... <laughs> She quit one day and shocked the world. I mean, she was on the Today Show. She was interviewed by Katie Couric, and she said, I'm doing it for my family. I miss my family, and she moved back to Illinois, and she... Erin was nine, and Erin has two brothers, and Brenda dedicated herself to her family for, what, six, seven years. What Brenda did brilliantly was she joined about six big public company boards in different industries. She, she was on the Avon board, the Sears board, the Starwood board, the Lucas Films board, the New York Times board. What am I missing? PepsiCo bottling. PepsiCo bo Pepsi bottling. And she did it, I think, because she didn't know what, she, what industry she wanted to go back to. So she, she came back to Sarah, she, she became the president and then the CEO of Sarah Lee. And in 2005, when Brenda was CEO of Sarah Lee, and after Carly Fiorina had gotten ousted from HP, and before a short period of a couple of months when Pat Wirtz and Irene Rosenfeld and Indra Nui became C the CEOs of ADM, Kraft, and PepsiCo, Brenda was actually running the largest female-led Fortune 500 company in America. So, she continued to restructure Sara Lee in a in radical way, selling off a lot of stuff. And Brenda was always kind of under the radar and just doing her job. And it was actually 2010, it was May of 2010. Brenda, tell us what happened on that Tuesday night. Well, it was like any other day, I'd put in a long day at work and I was living alone at the time. Kids were off at college and I had gotten divorced by then. So I would go work out at 8 o'clock at night. So I did the same thing. I drove to my workout place, and I was lifting weights. I said, you know, I'm getting kind of old, so I better work on my bones here, <laughs> keep them strong. So when I stepped off the weight machine, I collapsed. I just went down on the ground, and the, work, the woman who was my trainer said, you're dragging your left side. Are you OK? And I said, well, I can't stand up. So she promptly called an ambulance, and I'm there thinking, oh my gosh, what's going on? Am I having a stroke? What's happening? So they got me in the ambulance, and she, I was alert at the time, and I said, here's my name, here's my doctor at the hospital, here's my sister's number to call. You know, and I kept repeating it, because I didn't want to end up at the hospital and have no one be there to see me. So uh, we get to the hospital, and I was alert up until the time I got to the hospital. And from that point on, I was unconscious and not knowing what was going on. So it was quite a shock, and then maybe Aaron could pick up after that because I was unconscious. <laughs> so Aaron was a senior at, at Notre Dame. She was due to graduate that following Sunday. And Aaron, tell us what you did. So it was a Tuesday night. It was senior week, so we had finished classes, and we had a week of festivities before our graduation day. And luckily that Tuesday, my friends and I decided we had enough partying, so we decided to stay in for the night. Um, I was in a McDonald's drive through and I got a call from my older brother, and it, you know, your heart drops. It starts with, are you driving? Yes. Uh, can you pull over? Yes. Um, so I, I, I quite honestly couldn't tell you what he told me, but I know I was in the car five minutes later. Uh, by the time I got to the hospital, my mother was already in surgery, and I remember that uh, about an hour later, the surgeon came back in the room and pulled my aunt, my brothers, and I uh, in a room. And again, I don't know what he told me, but I knew it was serious. It's all a little hazy now. But I remember walking out of that room and looking at my aunt and saying, did he say if mom wakes up? So for, for a couple of weeks, it was, um, sorry. It was. Um, Nip and tuck. It was very touch and go. So she was, um, she was medically induced in a coma for two weeks. Um, the doctor kept assuring us that, uh, you know, the number one priority right now is to make sure that your mom wakes up. And for the surgery, they had remained part of my skull because my brain was swelling and knew that that was going to be the, you know, short-term thing. And eventually, if I did recover, 
I'd have to close up that hole again. <laughs> but so I had a major brain surgery at that point in time, getting rid of the blood. I had a bleed, not a blockage. I had a major bleed. And depending on where the bleed goes in the brain depends on how affected you are, what side of your body, what part of your body, what functionality, what fun, you know, and they didn't know until eventually I came out whenever that happened. And so you were in a medically induced coma for two weeks and you were actually having lots of activity in your own head when you were, when you were, <laughs> <laughs> when you were under. Just talk about that. This is the part of the story that actually had to be cut. Yeah. Well, I had been given propofol, you know, which is a Michael Jackson drug and I guess... <laughs> Fortunately, I came out better, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess one of the effects of that is you, you dream and you have these thoughts. And I, I could have sworn everything that I was going through was real. I told Irene Rosenfeld she was in my dream at the time. <laughs> George Lucas was in my dream because I was on his board. And I, could, I told all these stories to my kids about everything that happened. I would have sworn I was in San Francisco, but I wasn't. I was in Illinois, and I went through all the stories about it. So that's when I came out, it was, I lived in a different world for that period, thinking everything I experienced was real. And then I finally came to consciousness, eventually. So Brenda, you were in the hospital for how long? It was about three and a half months. Yeah. And after how many weeks you went to Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, which which was uh, what week, how many, how many weeks? She was in Edward Hospital in Naperville, Illinois for about three and a half weeks before okay. we got the green light to go to rehab. Um, and it was, uh, so probably three and a half weeks later and then was at the Rehab Institute for a five week inpatient stay and a couple weeks. And this Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago happens to be the top ranked rehab center in the United States by the NIH. Right. And Tell us about that. What was that like? How, what, what was it like when you got there? And how did you enable yourself to make progress? It might be helpful if I just describe what I was like when I got there. And Erin, I'm sure, can elaborate on that. But I couldn't hold my head up. I couldn't sit up. I had no balance. I couldn't move my left side of my body. I was paralyzed. So I was just there, not knowing what was going to happen to me and how I was going to go about doing things. But once I got there, they put you on this regimen every day. It was like almost like working as a CEO. <laughs> <laughs> every hour there was something else. You work on this, work on that, work on that. I also couldn't eat. I, my swallowing was paralyzed. I had a feeding tube. I mean, I was in pretty bad shape, actually. So then over the course of time, and this, this is something that I will never forget that as being a patient, the therapists I had were so motivating. They, wanted, they got me to do things I never dreamed I could do. And just tell one funny story. Mm -hmm. One of the things I had to do, part of my initial exercise, was take a, imagine a little like laundry basket with rubber balls. I had to reach in it, take one, drop it in the other ball, in the other basket. I couldn't do that very well. I mean, it took everything in me to try to do that. So after I tried a couple, I went down and I grabbed three or four balls. <laughs> <laughs> and I dropped them. She said, no, 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 we don't do that here. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm into efficiency. <laughs> and she said, no, we're into repetition. <laughs> so that just talks about what it was like and that, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what your progress is. You don't know how damaged you are yet. You don't know what your brain power is like. So just day by day, I kept working on it, working at it, and it was hard work, really hard work. And you really, we talked about redefining what success is, yeah. right? And how, I mean, you were seeing people at RIC who were helping you with that, with the psychological acceptance of, of what you were going through, and what kind of advice did they give you, and was it helpful? That's what was so motivating about them. When you think about doing a simple task of doing that, or trying to stand up eventually, to feel so successful when you actually did it. You know, it was like, oh my god, I just stood up, or I was on my two feet holding onto bars. You say, that's progress, and they would cheer you on and say, that's wonderful. And I thought, lesson takeaway for me is, make sure you give your employees, your children, whatever, 
you know, thankfulness and congratulations on whatever task it is, because it's so, I know for me, it was so easy not to recognize all that as a working woman, and it takes so little. And it motivated me, and all I found myself wanting to do was please my therapist. So it was by inches. I said the progress at first was by inches. Then it became, you know, a foot at a time, and then it became, got to a point, and then it slowed down. Then you have to work harder for the next stage of it. And you're really working on rewiring your brain. You may read about, um, what's the name of it? Oh, um, the book. The, Neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, yeah, that oh. the brain actually, they now know that it can, in fact, rechannel its waves and where things are going. Like if it may have taken a path before you had the stroke, the brain finds a way to repath the road, you know, the road map, so that when, when you can't move your arm, eventually the brain will help you figure out how to reroute, reroute it and then be able to move the arm, although that hasn't happened yet. Erin, <laughs> <laughs> talk about the decision you faced about whether to go take this job. You had actually started this job I at did. Campbell so Soup? I did. I got the phone call graduation week. Um, I ran over, I graduated, I ran back for the day. I slept in the hospital every day for 20 days or so. Um, and I knew I had this job to start. So I, I was lucky enough to have an opportunity with Campbell's that I had secured my second semester, so I had many months to prepare for this job. I graduated in a recession, so I was feeling a little bit uh, conflicted with what to do. So I had this major uh, trauma in our life, and, and the most difficult part was the uncertainty for, for so many days of what was going to happen. None of us knew the extent of the injury. Um, we were just kind of in survival mode, really dealing with what the task at hand, which was I know my mom needed me at that moment. So I remember the day I had, I had talked with Campbell's. I told them, you know, I have this, this thing going on. I don't know how, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. So the day came, I started my job. Uh, I was in a sales job, so I got in my car and I was driving to my grocery stores and before I knew it, I would miss the hospital visiting hours and I started coming home and I said, I can't do this, you know, I can't, my mom is at the hospital all day by herself or if my brothers were able to be there, they, you know, they certainly were there, but I said, you know, my mom left her job at the pinnacle of her career to spend more time with us and I remember I called my dad and I said, I, I think I'm gonna leave my job, you know, mom needs me. And uh, I, I came home one day and from the support of my three roommates, they said, do it. So I came into the hospital and I said, mom, the decision's been made, I'm gonna do it. She never asked me to. She, no, no. as of course, as a mother, felt terrible that I was giving up anything for her. Um, but I had, I would have never changed my decision if I had to make it a million times over. Uh, we had a wonderful year together. Uh, Campbell's could not have been more wonderful when I left. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was a decision that had to be made, and I was, mm -hmm. you know. Good decision. Yep. Good decision. Who has questions? I, I would just like to say, as a mother, I never would have asked Erin to do what she did. And I felt guilty that she was doing what she did. And yet, I like to think that if you do what you want to do raising children, of course that's the decision she would make. So I'm so proud of her that, you know, no matter what the outcome was going to be, she just said, I'm doing it, told, didn't give me a question for it because I probably would have said no. <laughs> She's been telling me to do a lot lately, actually. <laughs> But it couldn't have been more helpful to me to have a family member and let alone my daughter helping me get through this. Because it's emotionally tough, physically it's tough. And in, in like a light switch, your life totally, totally changes. You can't do anything you used to do. You don't have the job you've had for 40 years in terms of working. And you're there and you're saying, you know, all I have to worry about is being able to walk. You know, it's, you have to talk about rechanging priorities and milestones. You say, I hope someday I can walk. And, you know, you don't even begin to think about other things. It's like, I got to get back. And so that Aaron there was just tremendous. By the way, Brenda 
is one of seven sisters. Yeah. Strong okay. family of girls. Yes. You know what she was, they, they each had names of the seven dwarves. You know what her name was? Bashful. Yes. <laughs> It's very accurate, too, really. <laughs> oh, you're, you're up here. You're no longer bashful. Yeah. Uh, OK, I think we have a question right here. Yeah, Mary Cranston, I <laughs> just want to tell you how much I appreciate you coming here. It's so inspiring to see you. It's just wonderful to see you back. Thank you. And I wanted to follow, on your, follow up on your last comment, which was, uh, what was the psychological process like as you, you wake up, all of a sudden you are a very different person, or you're the same person, but in a very different body, I guess is one way to think about it. What was that like? And as you look back on it, um, what were the blessings in it? Because there always yeah. are. Yeah. The thing I'm most proud of through this whole thing, besides Aaron, is that my kid, all three of my kids were fantastic. I never felt, oh, woe is me, why me? Why did this happen to me? I just never felt it. Because when you realize you almost died, you're happy to be alive. So I said, God, I'm alive. I've got to look at life, say I've given a chance to live through this. So I never felt sorry for myself. And a lot of people have told me that have known me the whole time is I didn't really change. That I'm still the same person. I still tell stupid jokes. Uh, um, I, you know, that part, I just didn't feel sorry for myself. I said, okay, there's something that happened to me. I got to get through it. The hardest thing of anything was having to depend on other people. You know, you all live it every day. You take care of yourselves. You do everything. You know how to handle everything you've had to. You did because you got to this, these positions, which, by the way, I am so impressed with this audience. I told Patty, I cannot believe what's happened in a few years. I applaud all of you. And I'm, I said, it's almost telling me I should go back and get a job because <laughs> you're all doing so many wonderful things. <laughs> but when all of a sudden you can't drive, you can't walk, you can't cook, you know, I still don't have function of my left arm. So I don't want to chop my fingers off when I'm cooking. So I need craft to come up with some more easy to prepare meals, I guess. Uh, <laughs> or, I wanna, or Hillshire. <laughs> I want to get a couple of, do we, do we have a mic over here? Uh, is there a mic anywhere over here? Yes, can we, okay, yes, Kay. Yeah, uh, Kay what a, what a, Kay Koplovitz, what a moving story. Good to see you back, really wonderful. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the wonderful connection that you and your family have had, but also thinking about people to whom this might happen who don't have those support systems around them. Was there anything that you observed through your journey so far that you could share with us? And did you see people that really didn't have that kind of support around them? And was there a difference in recovery? I definitely think there's a difference. I saw all range of different severity because RIC is the place that everybody goes to. I mean, it's really from the extreme to the not so bad. And the attitudes of watching the people interact with their families was interesting. Some of the families were there. Some came once in a while, because I lived there you know, for a while. And some of the patients, their personality changed, so they were angry. They would yell at their family. I mean, it was. If I had been their family, it would have been very difficult to be with that person because the extreme of what they're going through comes out in anger and yelling and not accepting things that happen. So I think it's a combination of what did happen to your brain, to your brain? did it change in that way? And what's the relationship between the people, maybe even before the stroke to after the stroke? What do people do? There are a lot of agencies that you can hire people. I tried that. If I wanted Aaron to go back to work. I, got, I almost had to kick you out and say, you got to get on with your life. You're 21, 22 years old. You've got to go back to work. I'll find a solution. So I actually tried some of the agencies, and I could afford to have them. So that's the good news. The bad news is you have someone you don't know living in your house, having to deal with you in personal ways. I thought it was awful. So I mean, I was just thankful that I had the family. And now when Aaron went to work, one of my sisters has stepped in and lives with me five days a week. So that worked out great. Um, we are actually out of time, and I'm sorry. And I want to end this with, don't want to leave out. If you have any advice, Brenda or Aaron, to this high-powered, hardworking audience, they would welcome it. So far be it for me to be the one giving advice to a a room of this caliber, but if I may, 
Um, I know you all burn the midnight oil. I know there's always more work to be done that will keep you at your desk the extra hour, two hours, six hours. Um, but tomorrow is never promised. You know, it's, um, your life can, can change in an instant, and I urge you all to go home and have dinner with your family and take the extra time for yourself and take care of yourself and sleep. It is the number one healer and the most important thing you can do for yourself. Um, you know, I, I see it from a different set of eyes growing up with a mom who slept four hours her entire life, and that's just what she did. And it's a curse, you know. I think unless something forced her to slow down, I don't know that she ever would have. Um, but don't let something force you to slow down. Just uh, make sure you take the time to, you know, appreciate every day. And I would add on to that similar thought. Live in the moment and enjoy the moment. It's so easy to look back. It's so easy to plan for the future. And then in the meantime, what happens is the current passes you by. Just live life to the fullest. You know, make your own choices. People have said that earlier this morning. The power is in you to make your own choices. I made a few different ones over the years. You control them. Nobody else controls them for you. Make the ones that are best for you and best for the long term as well. So you have the power, you are powerful, you have it in you to control what happens to you as well. Brenda and Aaron, thank you so much. For